three hours it's not a small amount of time, but I think that uh, people have really interesting things to say and uh, I'm sure that also this uh, second session will bring some interesting new topics and issues. So let me greet and introduce the speakers of the second session. It's again a great pleasure and honor to share the floor with all of them. Starting with uh, Francis Corner, who you of course know, uh, who is um, head of uh, London College of Fashion and of course chair of IFTI but for me also a person who gave me the most of the inspiration while I was uh, preparing these talks because I understood that she comes from a similar background as I from the art and that gave a lot of confidence that somebody who has that kind of background can do something really extraordinary in the field of fashion and fashion education. We have Uning as again, somebody that do not need a special presentations and it's difficult to present him because Uning is uh, more than a renaissance man. He is really doing so many different things and I think he was a kind of nomad through the disciplines from the early beginning. Starting as a poet and a writer, going through the music, moving into the uh, architecture, if I'm not wrong, to the urbanism, always channeling art into all of that and now he is uh, starting, um, or he already start and, and build up something that we call, can call a new type of a community, something that is almost a sort of realized utopia. We have here uh, Adele Verko, um, somebody who calls herself uh, a performer, agent, uh, how can I say, uh, fashion activist, uh, something like that, somebody who really, again, tries to stress uh, the question, um, when you will come from the fashion design background, how can you expand this idea and engage a little bit more into the field of um, social interaction? We have Tony ben Bendel. <laughs> Um, again, somebody who is very close to art and curating. Uh, he is a professor at Manchester University, as well as a fashion designer, artist. Again, somebody who is, we should use more Cecil word, in, in, somebody who is in-betweener as well. As well as Aki, who is um, one of the professors uh, at the Polymoda, shoe designer, as well as one of the contributors um, on the exhibition that we have set up. So, again, very, how can I say, polyadric group of people with whom I would um, like to, to start discussing something that we left uh, in, in this uh, ending of a previous discussion, and I think it's a um, question of um, type of responsibility that we have um, uh, when we are operating in all these fields, which might be education, which we can call art, or we can call fashion, and so on. So, um, I would like to start with uh, Francis, because uh, I saw that uh, within the um, program of uh, London uh, College of Fashion, there is an enormous amount of artists who you engaged, and not only the artists, but artists who really try to stress this question of uh, social responsibility or ecological responsibility. I don't want to use the word sustainability, and I think it's a two different meanings, but I think uh, that it would be interesting to Tell us a little bit more why you wanted to give a floor to such artists like Lucy and Jorge Horta who are doing something which we can even see quite analog to what uh, Uning is doing. They are kind of also building something that can be called nationless and uh, boundless new state uh, positioned in Antarctica, which is the biggest reservoir of water, which is again one of the big questions for, for the humanity and for the world. And, uh, how we can, through this kind of, let's say, uh, awareness rising programs, also rise the cultural level or, and cultural importance and the impact of fashion. Right, so, um, in a way, it's, it's a very big, a big question, so I've, I've probably got a few things um, uh, to say. I think that one of the great things about fashion is that it um, touches so many different aspects of our lives, obviously as individuals, culturally, socially, economically, politically. 
Um, and I think that one of the things that's very important in, in terms of a fashion education and an institution is to demonstrate that fashion isn't a narrow um, definition that a lot of the public and a lot of media and a lot of people think that it is. You know, you say fashion to potential students and they tend to think of women's wear and if you're lucky they might think men's wear and, and they certainly don't always th even think of, of sort of shoes and accessories. So. I've always felt that part of what I wanted to do, and I think, again, that comes back to the fact that um, um, I, I was originally a fine artist, so I didn't have a particular definition of fashion, but was really fascinated in the way that it um, relates to so many different aspects of our lives. So within the college, I, I wanted to find different ways to, to sort of show not only how significant and important fashion is in, in this respect, but that also, when you are involved in education, you have a responsibility, um, not just to your, to your students, but also to your industries, to your staff, and to the discipline, and to find different ways that we can um, use fashion. I mean, it was spoken about in the previous session about issues to do with migration, about climate change, about all of those factors. And I think fashion has a great role to play in all of that. Um, and that we have a responsibility as educators to find different ways to make that happen. And part of it is to bring in individuals into institutions who have a different perspective, who will um, open not only the eyes of the institution and the students, but also of the various people that look at fashion to think, oh, you know, you know, like Lucy and Antarctica, the issues around how clothes symbolise the society and connect us. Helen Story, who's um, done uh, created clothing around catalytic clothing, so that the dress or the clothes that you wear could have um, an element added to them, so that when you wash the garments, um, then ultimately they'll absorb pollutants. She's working on a climate change dress at the moment to again highlight the importance and significance of, 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 of climate change. And I think fashion gives that. People don't necessarily understand, or you can draw them in, in a way that you're not shouting, you're not saying, this is what you must do, you know, you've got to do that. Actually, you're seduced by fashion. Um, and that's what I'm intrigued by and what I've tried to, to sort of um, uh, use within the college. Uh, I think there was something that I heard somebody say um, two weeks ago, and this was in the relation actually to women in education and, 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 and industry and, and being a successful <coughs> woman, but um, it, she said that um, when you get to the top, you must send the lift down. And, and I thought that was a great metaphor for different aspects of our, of, of our world and, and our lives. And so for me, within the fashion education an institution, we have the possibility to create projects that also, in a way, sends the lift down for other people. So that's why we do a lot of work with prisons, with community groups, with um, charities, uh, gangs, you know, all sorts of sex workers, all of those people who didn't have the opportunity. So for me, it's seeing it in the round. Artists and other individuals, we have psychologists, scientists who come into the college, they, in a way, open the world of fashion and help, uh, and help us to engage in the world in a very direct way to address the very issues. You know, we can't close our eyes and just say, oh, we're, you know, we're fashion, it doesn't touch us, of course it touches us. And, and I think we have a great tool which we have a responsibility to use. So you are talking about integration and this gives me a possibility to uh, come to Uning because that's what you were talking yesterday about. You said, yes, I want to build up an utopia, but I want also to include people which are not in the areas of art or however expanded we want to treat this. So, to, let's say, use this occasion to introduce a little bit better whole the process of how you came up to what you have now initiated in, in China. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the evolution of everything? So, from the first sketch in the Moleskine book up to I don't know, six villages that you have now, 2,000 and more people with whom you are collaborating, working, living, and enormous amount of, of activity. So maybe we can start with one page. Yes. I started the Bisan project from 2010, but before that I was commissioned by Venice Bianara to make a research project about an urban village in Guangzhou. 
and then through this uh, research project, I understood actually there's a lot of social problem in the city it was called by the rural area, because uh, the agriculture in the rural area almost stopped in China. A lot of people, uh, the villagers, they moved the city to the city to find a job, but they could not share the resources because they are from their villagers. They are not the city uh, city people. So uh, the people, the villagers who emigrate to the city have to stay at some place like a slum or urban village. Then I found actually uh, during the past 30 years, uh, China actually have this very rad radical uh, organization movement. This why I say it is radical because the organization means actually is a kind of distributions of the social resources. That means including property, including land, a lot of things. Uh, so um, it caused a lot of a problem because, uh, uh, for example, the government grabbed the land from the, from the villagers and sell, sell it to the developer with very low price and make a lot of money uh, by, uh, for government. And then a lot of uh, villagers start to protest. So today, actually, China has to face a very serious uh, political situation. At the same time, because the economic developed so fast, and the environment also <coughs> have a lot of problems. Let's say uh, the, the, the air pollution in Beijing and Shanghai actually get more and more people want to leave the city and move to the countryside. And also, when we look at the rural society in China, because a lot of people, young people, move to the city, so a lot of the village was now almost empty. There's only some old people there and children there. So to, 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 to face this pro, uh, problem, I think uh, there's a lot of Chinese intellectual and then start the so-called new rural reconstruction uh, movement from 2000. Uh, Bisan Project is part of this movement. It's, it's not an art, art project. It's a kind of a social movement. And, and, and then in 2000, 2010, I, I, I select Bisan Project in Anhui province as my base. And then I moved from Beijing to there and then I decided to start these projects. At the same time, because I'm very interested in the anarchy philosophy, and I also visit a lot of the intentional community in Northern America, Europe, New Zealand, and Australia. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in some idea, for example, co-housing idea, consensus decision-making uh, system, and also, also the idea of uh, permaculture. So I really want to put all this idea together with this uh, rural reconstruction movement thought together in, uh, in, 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 in this project. Um, when we move to the Bisan village, I, actually I, I found I have faced a lot of a problem. Huizhou, uh, the Bisan village is a is very typical Huizhou style village. It's a very beautiful vernacular architecture, Huizhou style. You should look in the internet, it looks like Shangri-La. I couldn't believe it when I saw how beautiful this architecture is and it was amazing that it's left like yeah. empty. But because of the depopulation, de, uh, de uh, the, most of the, this kind of house was empty. And then a lot of people in the city have this kind of anti-organization uh, feeling. People, they, they want to move to the to the countryside, so also the hot money also go, trying to go into the uh, uh, countryside. So we have to face the very serious problem of the gentrification. Mm. And what I want to do actually is not, uh, it's not like some middle class, uh, just move to the countryside to buy an old house and as a, as a, a, a space for holiday. I live and work there with my family, uh, and I become the neighbor 
uh, of the villages. And then I start to do a lot of uh, uh, event, festival, trying to activate the public life in the village. At the same time, it, I also did a lot of historical preservation projects. For example, uh, in 2010, I, I, I invite my friend to open a bookshop book there, Bisan, Bisan Bookstore there. Uh, the, the building used to be a, a clan houses, was empty for many years. And then uh, it's very interesting. I, I uh, persuade the villagers agree to, for us to use that building for free. They don't take any uh, rent from us. So the B sample store is actually, this project go beyond the property. We put the ownership of the property aside but trying to uh, active, activate this building as a public space. Now the bookstore is very successful. A lot of people from outside come, come uh, go to the uh, bookstore. At the same time, the villagers also go there for reading to share the internet. That is really uh, making, uh, I'm thinking of uh, in 2012, when I visit Rome. There's a theater in Rome, in Rome because the financial crisis, the, the, the Rome government don't have funding to continue to run of this theater. And then some kind of uh, 30 and 40 years old Italian intellectual, they occupy the theater. And they put, they put the ownership of the property aside and try to, <clears throat> and then organize a lot of a cultural event to activate the old theater as a successful public space. And I think this is really create a new idea of, of commons, mm -hmm. which Antonia Nigoli and Michael Hart said in the book, um, Common Wealth. So we did the same, same thing in b -side. And I, before I came here, I just opened a new space in the b village, the School of Tealers. Uh, it's a space for the contemporary agrarianist. I'm trying to create a, a new space for, for, the, for the people who think agriculture and rural rights are really important for, for the contemporary society. And why I call it School of Tealers. School of Tealers, um, a, couple, a couple years ago, I read a book by David Graeber, that the first 5,000 years, he mentioned actually School of Tealers is a school of philosophy in about a uh, thousand years ago. In, in Qing, Qing Dynasty, there's 100,000 of philosophy in China. School of Tealers is one of that. Uh, and David Graeber said, School of Tealers is the first anarchy people in the world because they, whatever they think, whatever you are a king or you are emperor or you are ordinary people, ordinary people, you have to farming together. So I named, named this uh, uh, new uh, space as School of Tila. Actually, it it used to be a, a storage, a full storage space, almost empty for many years, and then I regenerated and and opened this new space uh, in this month. I organize a lot of events for the real church. So, even if you say it is a part of a huge social movement, I think there are still some kind of, uh, how can I say, undercurrents that you are introducing in a very artistic way because you, uh, what we can see in the exhibition, you really uh, created all sorts of things that we think one state should have. There is uh, from the design of, for the money to design of the passport to design of the stamp even design of garments and um, uniforms or, or so, so in a certain way um, there is something artistic that you are injecting and moreover you are uh, putting in a collaboration different kind of people from what I understood you want to introduce into this uh, form of community also um, fashion designers who are in the same way trying to recuperate some of these old traditions and knowledges so can you tell us about why why do they need garments uh, styled in this way, or what is the idea behind? Okay, uh, this time I, uh, we designed the, the uh, uh, agri, agritopian 
dress for Bisan commune. Actually, it's not not a uniform. It's a it's a photo story. It's a it's a project trying to provide the imagination for the the lifestyle in contemporary rural society today in China. We we want to use this to engage the young people, move back to the countryside from the city. It's not it's not kind of fashion. Uh, I'm I'm totally agree with uh, Linda. Uh, we avoid using the, the, the term of fashion. Okay, it's not not the kind of fashion. It's it's a, a project. I designed some dress. It's a project. It's the idea is originally from some uh, utopian fiction. Yeah, uh, and then we try we 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 make this a uh, serial of the photo story and trying to engage the people, the young people, to come back, and also trying to deal with the the relationship between body, dress, and the land, because today's fashion industry actually it's it's totally is not 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 about the uh, it's totally forgot the the it's have no connection with countryside actually. And also when we're looking back uh, the battle to the land movement in nineteen seventy, actually the hippies they 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 develop a, a very strong style which have very strong connection with the land and their utopian idea. And just because um, this time I participate uh, if uh, I have a TI conference, I think I should realized my idea uh, five years ago. Five years ago, ago when, when I had this idea to set up the Bisan Commune, I, I, I already had this idea to design uh, some dress, uh, some utopian, some agri-topian dress. Agri-topian dress, okay. That sounds good. But um, what um, maybe strikes me, you talk about anarchy. And what we as Westerners uh, see um, uh, happening in China is a kind of reduction of the space for expression. How do you cope with that? I mean, you are kind of a counter movement and uh, what kind of possibility these kind of counter movements have in a country that looks uh, oppressing uh, freedom of expression? I mean, um, at least that's the, that's the impression that we have. Maybe it's not only because of Ai Weiwei, but uh, also it was very interesting what you wrote to me, that it's a kind of country, and uh, Tony was for almost a decade in China. It's a kind of country where it's very hard to emerge with something which is a counter-idea, counter-model, counter-culture. Anarchy is a really a sensitive word in China, you know, uh, so, in Chinese, the anarchy was translated as, just as uh, no government and or anti-government. That is not good. Uh, that is very bad translation. Actually, classical anarchy is very warm idea to get people help each other, uh, and then you don't you don't need a political agency. If you have something to do, you can take the direct action. And also, when you live in a small group. You can try to uh, distribute the, the community currency system, just like us. I designed the visa hours to exchange the labor, and we don't need the currencies in a, in a, a small of group. Of course, if you want to distribute the the, the community currency in a in a, a country in a, a country scale, it's impossible. Anarchy idea is to, it's really about uh, mutual aid help each other. So this is a very warm uh, idea. Actually, in, in rural society in China, people often did like this. For example, uh, my, uh, somebody want to, some villagers want to build a house and they don't have money and, and they will ask their neighbor to help, help them. And next time, they, when the neighbor build the house and will help back. So, they just exchange the labor. They don't need currency. This is a traditional rural life in China. We, what we want to do is just, just activate the traditional culture. It's, uh, I mean, the mutual aid or the mutual aid actually have a base in the rural life in China. What we do just want to activate it.
to start it up. So I would use the occasion to pass up to Tony because uh, in a certain way when you described the work that you are presenting here, which is uh, a kind of um, sculptural object that resembles a jacket. You were talking about um, uh, engaging also a kind of a narrative behind the object itself, and you referred to China even, and so on. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the genesis of this object, what kind of story it should set, tell us behind, because it's called Stories Without Stories. Is it a kind of empty signifier? Is it something else? How would you call this, um, this piece that you will be showing? Um, and how much it has to do with China as well? Yeah. The stories without stories is as it is. I mean, I think you put any narrative into it that you, that you want to. And I think what's interesting, what Unin was saying earlier on about um, the sense of culture and society that fashion reflects. I'm, not, I'm sorry, I used the word fashion. I'll stop using it for now. Um, and, Within all that, I think, again, what Francis was saying earlier about fashion and education, and I'm moving away from what your question was, um, just to make a point sure. earlier, um, which is about, in the UK particularly, and I think China is very similar from my, my experience of that, that uh, money has become very powerful, particularly in, in education. So you get, we are removing people from that system, whether we like it or not, and. The earlier conversation was about parents coming, what am I buying? You know, the, the exchange of a contract is existing now between us as providers of education and do we call them customers, do we call them clients? I don't know. Um, and it's the same with China, I think. You know, there's people with money, you know, go and educate themselves abroad and all those sort of things. So we're actually, I'll get back to my jacket in a moment. No so what we're actually doing is we're, we're removing whole, whole sections of society and culture from engaging with the creative process. And if we're not careful, it's going to become very elitist. So back to the jacket, right? Which is about, I suppose, the jacket is just a jacket. It's whatever it is, whatever you think it is. What became more important when we were building it was the process of building and the fact that it was done across borders, cross disciplinary, it was cardboard, it's meant to be thrown away, it's gonna to rain tomorrow, so go and see it today, because it's probably gonna be destroyed tomorrow, which is fine. Um, and so, so all these elements work, work together. It's, 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 it's a symbol, but it's not a symbol. It's discarded, but it's not discarded. It's a uniform, and as Oning was saying about the, the, the image of a sort of bohemian lifestyle, it, that, it doesn't matter really, you know, it, it's sort of irrelevant. And I think, you know, the want of sounding anti-everything I've been doing for 30 years, the, the fashion's sort of irrelevant in one sense, but has a real purpose in another sense, if you want it to be. And I think the problem that we have as educators and as fashion people, that a lot of people don't see it as particularly relevant, unfortunately. And, and from the discussion this morning, you know, we need to bring that back in. We, we, we need to say things with it that's sort of, you know, not necessarily that's really, really important, but it is about, it only exists in the political, the economical, and the social location that it is. And absolutely right, just back to the, the village in Bichon, you know, it doesn't really exist there. But that's fine, because actually, back to the jacket, it's about the memory of the garment that you've got, why you wear it, that we move away from oh, it's a Mark Jacobs, or it's a Dior, or it's a Hugo Boss, so what? No, you know, I'm wearing it to a particular event that's important to me, and I keep it, and I keep my wardrobe over a period of years, and I add to it, and I change to it. And so we had a conversation yesterday with a few people about holes. You know, I love this jacket, it's covered in holes, I don't care. Do you know what I mean? And that's, that's part of the whole process, I think, that, that you engage with a garment and it's got your story embedded with it and it's important to you and it doesn't matter what the label is and it doesn't matter where you bought it, it's where you engage with it. Yeah, I think it's very interesting what you're saying because you are talking about stripping down the idea or certain stereotype of fashion and bringing it to something else and uh, talking about that and talking about um, 
the change of, of this idea of fashion as producer of some kind of uh, illusion or ideal, I would like to come to Aki because what you, and why it was yeah, interesting absolutely. to have you together because you created this kind of large size XXXL size jacket and it's a kind of a monument which is again a, a counter monument or something that is completely dematerializing this monumentality of fashion. And you um, created a, a sort of a human size um, magazine which again uh, goes against uh, what uh, magazine or fashion usually is. I don't know how you would say in English patinato, but uh, this kind of magazine that uh, everything is photoshopped, everything is so idealized, that you lose completely the idea of what is the real body. So you wanted to, in a certain way, come back to something that give us the sense of what is the aesthetic without this idealization. Yeah, the, the starting point for this project with uh, Ruggiero Mengoni, who was my collaborator, a photographer for this magazine, was that um, you know I have a total magazine fetish, and I love magazines, I love the smell of magazines, and um, the, the whole world of it, but I always felt that I just sort of a, was in a sort of a different, um, you look at it such a different perspective. And um, we really wanted to create an object that you have to actually make kind of a pilgrimage to. It was a little bit inspired by many things, but uh, we have an executive client from Kuwait who is in charge of distributing luxury perfumes to Middle East. So you can imagine the, the power he has uh, for that level. And I took him to the Santa Maria Novella pharmacy here, which is a must place to visit in, in, in Florence. And he walked in and the place is completely induced with this amazing scent. And he said, I want to buy this smell. And our guide said that you smell in 600 years of history, it cannot be bought. And I thought it was so nice that we experienced so much through the internet, and we exper experienced so much through the virtual world, going back to the previous conversation of Stefan, and I just agree with everybody. Um, I have nothing against with this sort of virtual uh, existence. So I thought it would be nice to create a, a magazine that you cannot uh, simply just go to a stand and buy. You can buy it, by the way, if you want, but it'd be quite expensive. <laughs> and it's something that you cannot download from the internet. And it's something that you actually have to go and have a physical um, connection with. And also the fact that it's not an easy magazine to, to uh, deal with it's by the way it's a fashion issue I have no problem with the word fashion I love the you know the whole world with it but it is a fashion magazine yet there's no clothing in it so we felt that the start of fashion in this sort of a revolutionizing the idea of fashion should start from the from the human body and being able to accept it so the fact that it's not so easy that you need two people to turn the pages first of all so you really need, we kind of like forced the spectator to really pay attention what they're seeing. And um, we have uh, only nude models in it. We have some text. We didn't blow up the text to be human, you know, big size, because I didn't want the magazine to be a blown up magazine. So the text is kept at the normal, normal you know, reading level. And also the fact about digital media and the world of fashion completely altering uh, this fantasy. I know that I think the editor of Vogue said that, well, if you want reality, look in the mirror. But I think we are just getting so uh, disturbed. Uh, it's, it's the, the, the vision of, of this, what we see in fashion magazine is so, so it's just strange. I don't know. It's not close to what, what, what we are. So we decided that we're not going to Photoshop any of the models. So you see all the pimples, you see all the odd little unshaven pubic hairs maybe sticking out of there. And we kept these uh, beautiful creatures as, as they are. And uh, I think we need to, we need to pick that, bring that kind of a reality uh, back into the world of uh, fashion, if, if you say so. So in a certain way, it also gives us possibility to talk about your work from the very beginning. What attracted me was that you come from a fashion design studies and uh, uh, little by little you kind of uh, moved towards something that is almost, uh, how can I say, taking away the idea that uh, fashion is a garment. You created uh, 
garments by folding skin and later on you kind of made the fashion shows where actually the garment was a text and it was just read and taught. So can you tell me about this uh, moment, why all of a sudden you wanted to move on from, from the garment creating to something that really puts you in confrontation with the body and the body itself, the skin itself becomes something that we wear and then treat as a garment. Thank you. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, yeah, so I guess the Imagining Chanel project was looking at how garments are described in museum archives. So it was actually developed while I was spending some time at London College of Fashion and looking at how the VNA describes their garments in their collection and how we can experience clothes through the spoken or the written word. So I guess it was going back also to the story of the Emperor's New Clothes and how the sensation of feeling dressed or being dressed could be created through a story or through a belief or through the way the people around you are behaving. So with, um, I mean, are we all familiar with the story of the Emperor's New Clothes out there? I'm hoping, yes. <laughs> So I guess this moment, these tailors that are working with him and they're describing this cloth and this garment that they're making to, um, for him to the point where he actually starts to believe that he's wearing this suit. And until he walks through this procession and the little boy says, oh, but he's not wearing any clothes. So I guess I'm, I'm quite interested in how that moment is created and what can happen if the bodies are nude but there's a story being told and that tr really tries to ignite the audience's imagination to start to maybe imagine these clothes that are being worn. You're also quite interested in triggering some kind of social interaction and playing a little bit with taboos and so on. So um, how would you see yourself as somebody who is a kind of fashion practitioner but outside of what we conventionally even see as the spaces for fashion. It might not be only the shop, it's even the museum, but your kind of practice really demands for some kind of new platform. Where would you position yourself? Yeah, well, I guess um, I'm really interested in how clothing and dress shapes the way we act and behave and respond towards each other. So it's really the everyday and the streets and the situation or the occasion that we're in. And I guess I see every situation as being an opportunity because clothing is something that we all wear and that we all connect through. Um, it can also create segregation, but it can also bring people together. And, you know, we get dressed every day and it might be to meet a specific person or for, for a specific situation. And I'm interested in this, this process of dressing, the way we build our character or shape the way we want to be perceived. And I guess these jumpsuits is also playing a role in that too. And just how by shifting the way we dress, it completely transforms our everyday experience and the way we relate to people and how sometimes we can be drawn to those that dress similar to us and we can relate to them. And I guess that is the power of dress as well. So through these works, these performances or situations, I really try to amplify that and for me it's quite exciting to work in the everyday, more in an intervention. Uh, so it's not so much these are the performers, this is the audience, it's in amongst, it's, it's already happening and it's just really tapping into actually what's already happening and bringing that to the fore, to the highlight, to amplify to amplify this situation and the things, the invisible things that are at play through clothing within that. And Daki, we, we talked before, what about taboos? I mean, we are talking here about fashion and naked bodies and is nakedness again in or it's a taboo? Well, I think nakedness has always been in, um, in a certain kind of environment, but I think... But there uh, are more taboos in fashion now. Well, I, I, I don't, it's a really big question. And we, with the trend forecasting students, we did a magazine dealing with this idea of taboo already. Um, I, I wrote in, the, in, the, in your interview that 
you know, I can't somehow imagine the Vivian Westwood destroy T-shirt being uh, well received in today's world. So, you know, with the crucifix upside down, with the swastika and the word destroy, etc., evoking this idea of anarchy, of, of you know, fighting against your parents, you know, beliefs, being, being well received today. But um, I certainly do think that uh, nudity has been somehow again. Um, well, what the personal experience with the magazine is that a lot of the institutions did not, uh, they were kind of afraid of the idea of, of, of showing the, presenting the magazine because of the nudity in it, even though there's not one penis in it. It is this sort of a phobia of penis, I think that's often is, uh, um, you know, censored in, in, in media. And this is why I really loved Rick Owens' uh, last catwalk, even though I probably will not wear it myself, but I really appreciated it, yet it was censored by most of the main online, you know, fashion, um, fashion website, but I feel like Francis wants to say something. I, I was just going to sort of add, I mean, I th think the other um, aspect if we're talking about taboos is that we've done um, projects around modest dressing, and if you think about veiling and hijabs and burqas, and in a, in a way, there you have a fully clothed, more than a fully clothed body in a way, and again, that sets up all sorts of taboos and, you know, um, preconceptions, prejudices, um, and, and again, all sorts of discourse around, the, particularly for women, um, of their places, and all sorts of assumptions, and again, all sorts of projections by us within the West, for want of a better way of describing it, and we project onto different cultures, all sorts of issues, simply by the way. And I think it's very interesting that clothes still can be the great taboo, in a way. And that's back to what we were talking about earlier, back to the sort of jacket thing. So it's about identity and, you know, people's individual identities, whether it's the, the, the Rick Owen penis thing or the burgers in, in the UK see a lot. I've just moved to Manchester. There's a lot of um, Asian women uh, who dress head to toe in Manchester. And I think that gives you a, a sort of sense of nervousness as well with, with the stuff, again, back to the political and the economic uh, across the world. Uh, um, that we, we, we have to sort of respond to it as fashion mm. people, whatever fashion people do or means, you know, mm. that, that we have a responsibility again to, to make sure that mm. there's sort of, there's a response to that somewhere, like the magazine, there's a response mm. to it, which is fantastic, you know, mm. and Unain's response is, is very specific, because mm. it is difficult in China, absolutely, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult place to, you know, as I, I said think, earlier, that, to yeah. have some sort of comment about anything. We don't know much about it. No, I mean, it is, I just sort of add one, that's why I think it's very interesting what you're saying about nudity. You know, again, that's, that's just all, the, you know, the ultimate taboo, we can't walk down the street totally naked. Um, uh, but I do think the um, issue about the politics of clothing, um, I met uh, a, a, a woman who's a fashion designer based in the, um, in Dubai. Um, she obviously does a lot of, uh, designs for a lot of traditional uh, Muslim dress. Prior to 9-11, she didn't wear traditional, she, she didn't wear the hijab and things like that after 9-11. And the sort of media response to um, Muslim and, and the Islamophobia that happened meant that her reaction was actually to start making a very strong statement to say, this is my belief. You know, um, she's still very much engaged with capitalism, for want of a better way of describing it, you know, and, and so on, and all sorts of issues. And she's a very strong woman. And her, her husband is very... Uh, supportive and promotes um, the, the sort of uh, the way that she dresses and the sort of business that she has. So I think it, it you know, there are these other areas, and I think it's very interesting that it's the sort of it's the, the fully clothed and the nude that still makes people very, very uncomfortable. The two polar opposites, and of course, it is the idea of the you know clothing the body that actually makes the body it's the, the sexual excitant, as as we quote in our magazine. But what I also find quite um, funny is that. Uh, you say that you cannot walk down naked in the streets of Florence, but yet there are probably tens and thousands of uh, naked statues, uh, frescoes, paintings. <laughs> if anybody has been to the Duomo, the, 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 the actual Duomo, you see the most um, impossible <laughs> references to sexuality in there, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a great, I think, paradox. Um, one more thing that I thought would be interesting to stress, especially because uh, what we see here through the exhibitions and so on is emerging of something that is really in between fields. And um, 
I think uh, one of the, how can I say, m moments uh, for the future is uh, to see what are the possibilities within the educational system to, to give more possibilities for development of these kind of things because we were talking about this uh, way how the cultural value of fashion can be lifted and I think through these kind of things which are really conceptual, analytic, experimental and so on, one can foster these ideas of not only what fashion is but what it can become, what, what can it become in our minds. So what, what do you see as, a, let's say, possible flat platforms both in uh, education and even after because... Um, I think that's a really really important question and in a way one that's almost on one level impossible to answer, although I think that um, a lot of things that were being said earlier this morning about the relationship with science, um, about the inter interdisciplinary nature of fashion, the fact that it hooks onto everything, um, lots, of different, of, uh, lots of other disciplines, um, not just in the way that we teach, because I think again a lot of people look to the sort of collaborative team um, analysis, problem solving, communication, um, entrepreneurial aspects of fashion and other disciplines look to that. But I think for us it's about our relationships with technology, with digital, with science, with all aspects of science, whether it's chemists or engineers and so on. Um, because I think, you know, the, the, the point was referred to um, earlier about how connected we are to our phones. Well, you know, that digital connectedness is going to happen and some if we think about the internet of things. So how fashion as a discipline develops in relation to that I think is going to be a real challenge. And at the same time will be this, the idea of the artisan. Um, and, and that is a, very, it's a huge challenge for us as educators. Do we make our courses so more broad? Do we make them narrower? I mean, you know, the, if, it's, if, there are, if fashion is connected to so many different aspects, we can't be, we could end up educating students that know a little bit about everything and not enough. Um, so I think that's our, that's our challenge. And I've always believed that in terms of collaboration, you need to collaborate as an expert with another expert. And out of that can come extraordinary things. I think it's very difficult to be too broad. Um, but I think that is, our, that is going to be our big challenge. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I agree with that. It's also, I think, about um, we have a history of educators of having this sense of I'm, I'm a lecturer person, I'm educating you in, in a certain way. And I think that those days are gone. I think you, we have to, back to the customer word, but we have to engage people with them as people and, and give them ownership of what they're doing and their journey as a student so throughout the process from before they start until after they've gone. And it's not just sitting people in lecture theatre and talking at them. You know, I've seen that. I've seen people online looking at what people have been doing. So there's a connectivity there. So you, you can't fool students, you know, with old information because they can look at it as a, in a lecture theatre. So, so you've got to give them processes, I think, and, and projects and, again, collaborations that will engage them in the doing of something as well. So that, that there's much more engagement throughout the journey. And that will breed confidence and it'll also breed sort of individuality within there. And there won't be, as Fran said, suddenly just, oh, fashion is, sorry, use the word, fashion is uh, women's wear 18 to 24. You know, there's a much more diverse market out there and there's more jobs, really, if you talk about job market, in other areas than women's wear, if we're honest. I absolutely agree with all of you, but I really do believe that this education system is um, a moment to to share information, you know, it moves both ways between uh, the teacher and we, I like to call the students, you know, participants, because it is sort of a shared experience and exactly the day of, you know, being the sort of a high priest of knowledge and shoving it down students' throat. No, it is about sort of a shared experience now and that's how I see the future. But there are challenges for sure. Is it a little bit of everything or a lot of, you know, what is, what is the future? But it's a great discussion we can have. Or maybe we can all start creating a new villages like you are. <laughs> yeah, you're I, I, you're talking. I, I Do you consider a... yourself a teacher or educator because you don't have students, but again, you are passing some kind of knowledge to your neighbors, which are carpenters or I don't know, uh, people who work the land and so on. Yeah. Do you see your work as a kind of educative? Uh, I don't call myself educator because I totally don't agree that 
to educate people from top to down. Uh, you said, well, I totally agree with you. It, so it's about sharing. So I have a learning center in, in, in my school of tailors that um, the villagers can teach the people from outside for uh, wood work, uh, bamboo, bamboo working, and uh, the people from outside can uh, talk about how to uh, how to use the uh, EM uh, the micro. Uh, it's a new technology to change the soil and uh, then clean the liver. That means it's a space to, uh, for people to share different knowledge and skill. It's not about educate people from top to down. And the, when we looking back at the rural reconstruction movement in, uh, in, in 1930 and 1940, led by some very famous, big, uh, very famous Chinese in, in intellectual, the they education for ordinary people is a very part, important part of that movement. Because at that time, the Chinese farmer, they don't recognize the Chinese collector. And then they, um, they try to teach them. Um, but they're using a, a, a alternative wave. It's not like a, a normal uh, education system. They, they invent an uh, a alternative uh, system for to, 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 to um, teach the uh, villagers. And this is a very important topic because um, in uh, in 1930, 1940, there's a very famous educator, Tao Xingzhi. He, he uh, found a school in Nanjing, and he often sent students to a big city, no teacher with the, the student, and then they, they, they're working uh, in the neighborhood or on the street. They, they try to sell, uh, organize their daily life. They learn from the society. They, they do not learn from their teachers, they learn from the society. So, so this is a very uh, creative, alternative education uh, model. So we need Agora as a society, and <laughs> we then can become really a new pupil, so all of us. I wish to thank all of you for this session, uh, not to go later than what is our schedule, uh, so it was really extremely, for me, a pleasure to, to be able to learn so much because I saw that uh, actually the possibility to uh, moderate these talks for me was occasion to learn and to kind of dive in all this enormous amount of uh, extremely valuable and interesting experiences that you shared with us. I would like to, because I see that they are all very interesting people, I would like to ask uh, if in the audience are some comments or some questions. We still have 10 minutes and uh, I would feel a little bit bad that we are so isolated in the spotlight here and, you know, I see some phones illuminating some faces <laughs> talking about technology. So I was wondering if uh, from the audience we have some questions. comments, opinions, provocations. There is. And somebody can help me. We had one mic more. Ah, okay. No, I am very involved in this, uh, in this meeting. And I think I would like to express my, my thought. During uh, your um, speak, speakers, I, I think, but uh, especially I feel, I feel that uh, I is a you and the you is us. Us uh, together to, to, let, uh, to let to feel not only the smell, but the breath. The breath of our street that are covered from uh, I don't know the English word for asphalt, but uh, you see the streets are covered by uh, something that uh, cannot break. And uh, I think that uh, we are in, in the period in which we decide that from this street uh, there will be a new blossom. The flowers came out from the street that till now I not, have not prayed. So thank you so much for this uh, feeling. And uh, I would like to write to the prayer, to the primitive uh, 
start of the life when God gives the breath to the human being. Thank you. It's hard even to see if there are some more hands around. <laughs> you can lift your phones, that will be easier. Oh, yeah, one of the <laughs> Maybe we can have some more light and, and see us. Um, yes, I, I'd like to ask a question. I'm, I'm back here. Can you, hear, can you see oh, me? Oh, yeah. On your right. Stay there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not small either, so you should be able to see. I do have a question. That my name is Peter Liu. I'm from Hong Kong. I travel all the way here to Hong Kong to learn from new experts. I'm shy now. I'm very bold because I thought you could not see me. So, um, uh, I'll be quick. Um, yeah, it's, you talk about education, and uh, you talk about how we educate the next generation, uh, particularly in the fashion business. And as you know, in my, in my days as a student, I was in, uh, in London back in the 70s and 80s, uh, the cliche was the wisdom, knowledge is king. So our way of learning is to gather as much information as possible, but today, I have no power over my, my children because they can become an instant expert. When I was a kid, when I did not know how to bake a cake, I had to go to my mother and ask her because she had the experience to teach me. But now when my son did not know how to make a tiramisu, he could learn it online very quickly. So information is everywhere with uh, internet and levels of playing field. So it's not how much information we can get, it's what we make use of those information. And that requires no longer the routine learning of, of, of gathering of facts. Uh, how can we teach next generation fashion leaders to be creative uh, across a process? You talk about clothing, it's an expression, you talk about uh, uh, some people still consider it as a primitive protection to keep you warm, to protect your body from harm, or to hide the imperfections of your body as you get older like me. Um, but, but fundamentally, that creative juices in, in our future fashion leaders. How can we as a group uh, better prepare them uh, for this information age? And I don't know, 20 years later, it may not be uh, what we can imagine, but as, as educators helping the next generation, what should be the focus? Thank you. Um, shall I uh, sort of quickly start? I mean, I, I think um, in a way it's a question that a lot of us are asking ourselves all the time, that uh, a lot of our students, you know, why will they come to us if um, they can get all the information online and um, have been taught all sorts of digital skills whilst they were um, at school, even from primary school. Um, and, and I think in the end it is about that social interaction, it is about the collaborative nature and in a way in a global world it's about sharing that experience with um, other with students and um, industry and, and your you know, professors or whatever, all debating what the solutions might be. And I think, certainly my experience, you know, students come really hungry and creative and questioning and challenging, and our responsibility is to really bring that out. And I think the rest is about ability to take risks, to experiment, to try all sorts of materials, and that we can provide a sort of safe environment in a way for that to take place and I think that is still an important function for what we do um, uh, really that's that's what I that's a starting point for me um, and similar for me I think it's um, about building up a professional relationship with the students as well so that that you're both engaged like I say in this journey I think one of the things that we we should ask the students um, is not when they come on the course who your favorite designer is 
which a lot of them, so let's say Alexander Wong, for example, you should, they should be saying, oh, he's rubbish, he's gone, you know, I'm the next new one. And it's about encouraging people to be at the forefront of their practice from the, from the minute they start, really. And, um, and opening up the debates, absolutely, about what, what it's all about. Um, I do think, though, that there needs to be some skills in there for, for designers. They need to understand a certain amount of core skills, absolutely, but not to be um, just driven by those, if that makes sense. So it's, it's a combination. We, we were talking yesterday, just as a, 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 to add to that, uh, in the afternoon about research, about research through Artifact as well, which was an interesting debate as to how we actually develop intellectual rigour through non-written pieces. And I think that's something that will be developing further as in years to come, actually, as part of the debate of what fashion is about. And I actually do think that the problem is that everybody thinks that they're all of a sudden expert on everything. And I think that being a designer, being a shoe designer, fashion designer, it's much more than being, you know, just something you learn from the YouTube tutorial. And of course we would say that, but I think the, the, the foundation is that the craft is so important. The, you know, you need to, you know, you need to cut your finger with the knife uh, to understand, you know, the correct uh, way of cutting leather or, or, or using the scissors and all the tools that uh, we, we teach. So I think it's, uh, I think internet is just another great addition to all of this. And I don't, in my uh, classrooms, ban computers. I mean, students, they're like attached to computers. And I think it's a great way to even, you know, expand on the sharing experience. But it's also very dangerous to only count on, you know, information from Wikipedia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, of course, I use a lot myself. But I, I, I quite agree. I mean, I think in the end there are no shortcuts. And I think the, the problem with the, the digital and the sort of quick tutorial is that you think, you know, students can think, oh, I know it. You know, there is a shortcut. And actually there is still a hunger for that artisan sort of experience, whether you're a business student or, you know, a journalist, actually the skill of what you do is really fundamentally important and that's what we can also help um, sort of protect as well within, within our institutions. And we were also talking earlier, earlier panel about touch and smell and that sensitivity to just to fabric is something that really students find very, very difficult. Just getting access to the majority of fabrics is something that I think as institutions we need to build more into that as well, we do, get more access to the sensitivity, material, materiality. Well, I think already what we are doing here is teaching and learning one from each other and uh, maybe that is the, the way how one can uh, continue through this kind of dialogues and dialogues with excellencies which we had here on the floor and all of you. So I invite you to the uh, second uh, session. Oh, okay. Microphone. I think a big issue is passion and enthusiasm. And I think the, to bring it back play and joy to education is very essential. And uh, the senses are here with the answer. You know, to relearn what the senses can do, I think make that possible. Yeah, guys, one note, last note on this. Absolutely agree, with, absolutely agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. Absolutely. I would do immediately one with the flowers. There's something I do to say to the students as well, actually, and at the end of the day, I totally agree with you here. You know, we do take it a bit too seriously, this whole fashion thing. We really do take it too seriously. It's only clothes at the end of the day. Have some fun with it. And absolutely, totally agree. Thank you very much. So we will continue tomorrow with the next se session of talks and uh, I would like also that we open more the floor tomorrow. We will have some more time. And in meanwhile, I invite you to see these beautiful installations, follow the film session that will come now and enjoy and have some enthusiasm and fun. Thank you. Thank you.